Hey everybody, LivingC here. Today we're jumping into another fun-filled episode of The Twilight Zone. This time it's Season 3, Episode 3, The Shelter. It came out September 29th, 1961. And it's another episode I haven't sat down and watched before. But before we get started, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to continue on this voyage to Episode 156 of The Twilight Zone. And now, let's get into your comments on last week's episode, The Arrival. Akira Kurosawa says, Good episode. That it was, Akira. That it was. I definitely enjoyed it. Antonio Dragon 88 says, It's a good mystery, and when the sky was open is also a good mystery. Well, I'll have to check that out when I actually get to that episode, but thanks for letting me know, and uh, I'll let you know if I enjoyed it. Gene Everett 33 says, Not my favorite, but glad you enjoyed it. You got some golden blocks of episodes coming up. Episode 3 is a great episode. Enjoy, everybody. Well, now I'm looking forward to jumping into Episode 3. It seems like I've heard a lot of people talk discussing how much they've enjoyed this particular season, so definitely looking forward to uh, continuing on, because so far, every episode has been enjoyable, more so than the last, I would have to say. Genesis007 says, Classic series. That it is, and I'm enjoying it. The further along the line we keep going, definitely uh, looking forward to... Continuing on the Twilight Zone series, and even jumping into the 80s and the uh, 2000s, as well as, I think, uh, the late two, 2010s, or whatever decade you want to talk about. But, uh, hey, it, let me know, comment below, which, I'm sure the, the actual dance is probably going to be the original series, but maybe, other than the original series, which, like, sequel series did you enjoy most? Did you enjoy the one from the 80s? or the early 2000s, or possibly the one that was most recent with Jordan Peele. Let me know, I'd like to know your thoughts. Wooksen5847 actually writes a comment that deals a lot with politics, talk, discussing their viewpoint. I'll leave it up for people to actually look at and read and, and think amongst yourselves. When it comes to getting into this channel though, I don't like getting into politics. I don't really discuss the current state of politics, so whatever side you're on, I really don't care if you're Democrat, Republican, or somebody in the middle. But I just don't jump into the politics of things, and I like to stick to what's actually going on uh, more vaguely, you know. So when I'm talking about modern day politics, I don't jump into what side does what, or who does what, or who is the best, or who is the worst. It, it really doesn't matter to me when it comes to the Twilight Zone or anything else that we're doing on this channel, like the individual movies or the Versus episodes that I do. So I just try to keep politics out of it. Maybe at some point down the road I will start a more of a political discussion channel. But since it's just so divisive, divisive, I'm just uh, not going to jump into it. And I like to keep things kind of neutral here, like play uh, that way. But uh, anyways, thanks for the comment. Do appreciate it, Wixen. Gerald Stewart 8009 says, meh. <laughs> Guess you didn't like the episode, Charles. Oh well, it's not always everyone's cup of tea, but it is what it is. David E123 says the man at the beginning who was trying to get the passengers off the plane was played by Kurt Russell's father, Bing Russell. Oh, I didn't know that. That's very interesting to know. Yeah, I knew his father had some stuff to do with Hollywood. It's crazy that his son became so popular. Kurt Russell, love Kurt Russell. One of my favorite actors, actually. P Sparks3419 says so he was hallucinating. The Twilight Zone almost always keeps me guessing with its unpredictable endings. Very true. Uh, I hope there's more unpredictable endings going further into the future of these episodes. There have been a scattering of them in the second season. I think the first season had way more. But so far, season three has been giving me a lot of surprise endings, and we're not even that far into it. So looking forward to jumping even further in. Jonathan Stein says, The twist for this one has always fallen flat for me because of the logic plot hole of how the investigator could have hallucinated the staff of the airport if he never met them before. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I had to maybe go back and revisit it, but I kind of took it as if they'd seen each other in passing, even though they didn't see each other on the actual airport. It's like one of the guys actually heard of him and he's heard of him, uh, and maybe they kind of knew each other just because of them maybe seeing each other in the hallway or something, or they heard about them. I'm not sure. I mean, it can definitely be a plot hole. I'm not uh, saying otherwise because I just don't remember there being a, like an in-your-face plot hole unless it was just saying, yeah, maybe these people just kind of crossed paths at some point earlier on that we just never seen happen. But I don't know. I'll have to maybe revisit it and see what, what goes. Brian Hicks 3272 says... 
Strangely, I don't remember this particular episode very well, but rewatching it, it seems to make a, an even bigger impression on me now. I'm looking forward to the next episode. Everybody keeps telling me that. They're looking forward to see to, uh, episode 3 of season 3, so let's jump into it and see what we're getting into. The Twilight Zone. Ooh, happy-go-lucky music. Might mean we, we might end happy. <laughs> Someone's birthday. For today is one year older and admits to being over 21. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I doubt if there's a single person in this room who still does not owe the good doctor for a visit or two. The good doctor's bombs. Despite the fact that what the doctor thinks of as far-sightedness on his part has been a real pain in the neck to the rest of us, what with all the, the uh, concrete trucks and the, the nocturnal hammering and, and all the rest of it. Reminds me of uh, Blast from the Past. Christopher Walken played the absent-minded professor who made a bomb shelter below his 1960s home. Awesome movie. I'll definitely love it with Brendan Fraser, too. You may not have the biggest practice in medical history. That's... Single sawbones in the entire 50 states whose patients have such a regard. Yes, Paulie, what is it? The picture went out on the TV set. No. Well, the announcer said something about turn to the Conrad station on the radio. He said turn to the Conrad station, and then everything went completely blank. This ain't good. Four minutes ago, the President of the United States made the following announcement. Radar evidence of unidentified flying objects flying due southeast. We are declaring a state of yellow alert. That if you have a shelter already prepared, go there at once. If you do not have Come a shelter, on, use windows. All right, see you guys later. <laughs> if you're in your home, go to your prepared shelters or to your basement. Take the drink. Uh, what was that? Jets? It's the fervent and urgent prayer of all men of goodwill that it never shall happen. But in this place, in this moment, it does happen. This is the Twilight Zone. Guess sir, we're going to have a uh, nuclear war. Everyone's going to enter their bomb shelter, at least the guy who built one. I'm going to check the air filter down there. We'll get the rest of the stuff later. Bill, there's hardly any water coming through this tap. Uh-oh. Now make believe it's perfume. And it costs $100 an ounce. You got all the canned goods down, Polly? Yeah, all I can find. How about the fruit seller, Paul? I put those in, too. What about the books and stuff? Paul, oh, your father told you to get his bag. There's time, Grace. There's plenty of time. Keep your head together. Yeah, books are a good way to pass the time. Where do you keep the light bulbs? Oh, on the top shelf here of this cupboard, Bill. Well, I was going to buy some at the store yesterday because... Bill, I'm talking like some idiot. Conrad says from the first alarm, we might have anywhere between 15 minutes and a half an hour. He's got a nice shelter, it looks like. Now, you two stay here. I'll get the rest of the water. There's a small toolkit in the garage. Will you run out and get it? Right. I'll get the rest of the water. You just stay here and lose it. Now, if it is a bomb, there's no assurance it'll land near us. New York is only 40 miles away. And New York's going to get it. We know that. Be in a shelter, Grace. And with any luck at all, we'll survive. We've got food and water enough to last us for two weeks. Two weeks? Why is it so necessary to survive? What's the good of it? To continue on. Easier, just quicker if we just... <laughs> well, well, you married a winner, huh? Let's just give up. Let's just have our kid and I have a future. He may only inherit rubble now, but he's 12 years old. He's only 12 years old, Grace. That's right. Think of him. This is Connell Rad. You're Connell Rad. Get the tools, Pa. Good. Uh, put it down over there. I'll get the rest of the water. We repeat our previous announcement. We are in a state. Hey, neighbor. I'm not opening the door for you. Well, we collected about 30 gallons, and then the water stopped. Did yours stop, too? Jerry, you better get on home and get into your shelter. We don't have any cellar, remember? in the block. We I'm get sorry. everything at your beck and call, everything at your fingertips. All the wonders of modern science taken into account except that thing that's heading for us right now. Can I bring Martha and the kids over here? No. Oh. Sitting ducks, we don't have any protection at all. Oh. Maybe maybe travel away from the closest city. It's like the second best scenario. Go to the woods. People! Well, we'll bring our own food. We'll bring our own water. We'll, we'll sleep standing up if necessary. Please, Bill, you've got to help me. He sounds familiar. Look it out! When that door gets closed and locked, it stays closed and locked, Jerry. There'll be radiation and heaven knows what else. Says, I am sorry, but I built that for my family. It's my family I have to worry about. Do you think I'm going to stand by and watch my wife and children die in agony? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, please forgive me. He looks like the guy from Willy Wonka, the grandfather. 
But you didn't want to listen, well, Gary. None of you wanted to listen. Will. To build a shelter was to admit to the kind of age we lived in. Please, God, protect you, Jerry. It's out of my hands. No. It's got to be gone! See ya. He's locked himself in. Oh, he's got to let us in. We have no windows in half the basement. And I... Please let us in. <laughs> Marty, please. Jeez. Marty, I would if I could. I swear to you, I would. Bill, please. Please, Bill. It's Marty. Don't stand there asking me. I can't. Jeez. But you'll have blood on your hands. You're supposed to help people. You got to think of your family as, as crappy as it is to say when you built something for just the three of you. What are you supposed to let them in and then suddenly all of you die? I mean, that's the Spock answer. It's the logical answer. I know it's not like the human answer, but... Get out of here! Get out of here, Marty! I mean, should be prepared, I guess. He slammed the door right in my face. Well, go back. I can't. Jerry, ask him again. There's no Please. time. It'll land any Please. minute. I just know it'll land any minute. You won't let anybody in. I tell you, it just isn't fair. He's down there in a bomb shelter perfectly safe while our kids have to sit around and wait for a bomb to drop. Why don't we just go down to his basement and break down the door? Oh, yeah, that'll do. We can't all fit in that bomb shelter. We'd be crazy to even try. We could all go down there and tell him he's got the whole street against him. We could do that. What? We're killing everybody for no reason. You know, it saves the life of even one of my kids. I call that good reason. You know him, but God, desperation. Tell him to pick out one family. One family? Meaning yours, Marty, huh? They're gonna kill each other before they can even get down to the shelter. Make, is your baby any more precious than one of my kids? I never said that. That's the way it is when the foreigners come over here. Ooh, they were all foreigners here. We just, some of us got here sooner than others, that's all. <laughs> Keep it up, we won't even need a bomb. You'll be able to slaughter each other. Marty, go down to the shelter. Ask him, Marty, please. Searchlights must be coming closer. Come on, Frank, come on, let's go out and take a look. We gotta go. We what are you doing out here? Doc's got himself locked in that shelter down there. I wonder what the... I really thought this was going to be happy when it first started. Like, very quaint. You know, the music was beeping and bopping. Now we're in, like, post... Almost a post-apocalyptic world, like the beginning of it. You've got a bunch of your neighbors outside who want to stay alive. Well, you can just keep on doing what you're doing and we'll bust our way in there. They mean business out here. Why don't we get some kind of battering ram? That'll do. We'd have a whole mob to contend with, a whole bunch of strangers. Sure, what right have they got to come over here? This isn't their street. This isn't their shelter. This reminds me of that episode in uh, the first season where everybody was going crazy and it turned out to be aliens doing some kind of experiment on the human race. But you're acting like a mob, and a mob doesn't have any brains. You're proving it by what you're doing. Wait a minute. I agree with Jerry. I'm curious what the twist is, though. Nobody, nobody cares what you think, you or no. your kind. Think I think, I think the first order of business is to get you out of here. Okay, we have gone to the violent part. You've had your chance, Doctor, remember that! You've had your chance! These moments bring out the best and worst in everybody. Those people are our neighbors. The people we've lived with and alongside for 20 years. We better get up some of this furniture in this bunk so we'll have some protection in case that door goes through. Come on, let's get it in there! Let's tear the well, it turns out it ends up all being like a false alarm. <laughs> like, oh, just kidding. Yeah, we turn everything back on. Just a trial run to see if society falls apart before anything happens. Whoa, what a cheap door. Well, that was easy. Previously unidentified objects have now been definitely ascertained as being satellites. <laughs> oh, get out of my house. The state of emergency has officially been called off. We are in no danger. Oh, thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Okay, how are you going to be after the fact? Marty? Yeah, just, just leave. Just walk away. I, I went off my rocker. You can understand that, can't you? I, I just went off my rocker. I didn't mean any of those things I said to you. Yeah. We were scared, so confused. You can understand why we all blew our tops a little. Oh, I don't think Marty's going to hold it against you, Frank. Yeah, I would. We'll, we'll pay for the damages, Bill. We'll take up a collection right away. Huh? Oh, a big celebration. huh? Anything to get back to normal, huh? I don't think it's going to get back to normal. I don't know what normal is. I thought I did once. I told you we'd pay for the damages, Bill. 
I wonder if any one of us has any idea what those damages really are. Maybe one of them is finding out the kind of people we are just underneath the skin. I mean all of us, wild animals, who put such a price on staying alive that they'll claw their neighbors to death just for the privilege. We were spared a bomb tonight. But I wonder, I wonder if we weren't destroyed even without it. Yeah, he was the strongest, the smartest of you all, basically. He was very disappointed in how everyone became jerks. For civilization to survive, the human race has to remain civilized. Tonight's very small exercise in logic from the Twilight Zone. Well, that was The Shelter. Very interesting episode. I definitely enjoyed it. It was definitely better than the last one, I have to say. It, it uh, ranks very high on my radar so far in this season. Twilight Zone really likes to shine a light on society and what it would really actually be in these situations when we run into some hardships. Suddenly everyone's thinking of themselves. They're not caring about what others are doing. I mean, this guy was in his basement building a bomb shelter. They, everyone called him crazy for doing it. And then suddenly, boom, as soon as it becomes relevant, they need to jump down there and break down the door so everybody would die. It's like this guy built the shelter for him and his family alone. And there was only so much room that it could bear along with the life that it could sustain for a couple weeks. It wouldn't have done so with that many people stuck in that one small room. So it's like... Hey, you look, you didn't do any preparations. You break into my home, you come after me and my place of sanctuary, and then suddenly it's on him. It's his fault that he didn't uh, prepare everybody else. I'm sorry, but it's like, look, you built it for him and his family. It's him and his family alone. You should respect that and go and find your own way with your family. I know when you're desperate, you don't typically think rational or logically. But everybody should have gotten their car at that point, figured out the the fastest way out away from the largest cities, and head that way. Go towards the beach. Go into the woods. Some place where uh, you would hope that the winds aren't going. Maybe find where the winds are going to and go in the opposite direction of that. I don't know, but there are things you can do. When you're 40 miles out away from the biggest city, I seriously doubt that the bomb would be going off over you. But for the most part, there are those after thoughts that people don't think about, like radiation and it getting into the wind and blowing in your general direction. Hopefully we never have to go through any of this, but it really does shine a light on how humanity can just turn into an uncivilized thing when uh, the end is near. So hopefully that doesn't happen in my lifetime. I mean, we just never know what the future brings, but... I'm hoping for a better one. <laughs> Anyways, let's jump into some trivia and see what it took to get this episode off the ground. Early in the story, Paul tells the adults that their TV set has gone blank and that the viewers have been told to tune into the Conrad stations. The Conrad, which stood for Control of Electromagnetic Radiation, was a civil defense radio system that went into effect on December 10th, 1951. Under Conrad, most AM radio stations and all FM radio and television stations in the United States would go off the air in the event of a national emergency. Selected AM stations would then air official information and instructions to the public on the 640 and 1240 frequencies on the AM dial. Radios sold in the United States from 1953 to 1963 were required to display the triangular civil defense symbol on their dials at those frequencies. Effective August 5th, 1963, Conrad was replaced by the emergency broadcasting system, under which most AM, FM, and TV stations would remain on the air in the event of an emergency, but would switch over to the official news and information on January 1st, 1997. EBS was replaced by the current emergency alert system, which is essentially EBS plus cable TV and satellite TV and radio. Sandy Kenyon's character mentions going over to Bennett Avenue to get a pipe for a battering ram. Bennett Avenue is where creator Rod Serling grew up as a child in New York. The plot was rather daring for the time, and it's a depiction of racial intolerance and paranoia. This episode was parodied in the sixth season episode of The Simpsons, Bart's Comet, 1995. A similar subject was covered in the first season of Happy Days, called Be the First on Your Block. 
On May 7, 1974, the Cunninghams contemplate adding a bomb shelter to the backyard until friends want to know if they will be included. The plot was adapted for the Twilight Zone radio show hosted by Stacy Keach. The last unnamed neighbor to join the assault on the bomb shelter is carrying a rectangular palm-sized device. This is a first-generation transistor radio that had come on the market about four years previous. These small, easily carried radios were popular with sports fans who would take these to stadiums as well as with teenagers and played no small part in the popularity of rock and roll music in the 50s and 60s. In doubtless an intentional bit of casting, the portrayal of the doc's wife by Peggy Stewart is nearly identical to Barbara Billingsley, June Cleaver on then popular Leave it to Beaver from her speech patterns, color, and style of hair, the cut of her dress, and June's ever-present pearl necklace. She is a near twin to have a beloved television American mom thrown into the horror of a nuclear attack would be shocking indeed. Exteriors of the home and street along with the opening music are also emblematic of Leave it to Beaver and others 50 sitcoms. Yeah, I kind of got the gist of that. Joseph Bernard portrayed Marty Wise a year earlier he portrayed Mindy Wise in Murder, Inc. James Coburn, lead actor of The Old Man in the Cave, is the voice on the radio announcing that the scare was simply satellites. Ah, oh, that's cool. I know who James Coburn is. One He was uh, really good in Like Flint. I mean, who doesn't know who James Coburn is other than probably the younger generation, but... Uh, and the guy that I said looked like the grandpa from Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory was Jack Albertson from Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. So that's pretty cool. Anyways, thanks for watching. Tune in next time for the next episode of The Twilight Zone. Until then, see you later.